All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julie Parker, and we are here for our weekly Wednesday media briefing. As usual, County Executive Mark Elrich is here, along with County Health Officer Dr. Travis Gales. Also this week, Dr. Earl Stoddard, who is our um, Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security Director, is here to talk about a few recovery matters. Um, we have a few brief uh, opening remarks about where phase two stands. Um, as you all know, Montgomery County will open on Friday at five o'clock for phase two, but we have some additions we'd like to share with you. And for that, I'll turn it over to the county executive. So um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we are um, at the beginning of uh, phase two reopening. That'll begin this Friday at five o'clock. Uh, I think you all have probably read the press releases and everything else. We've um, we continue to open things with um, restrictions. Uh, we are <clears throat> this is part of a gradual process, and we're trying to avoid uh, what has happened in other jurisdictions around the country. We're, we're having reopened. They're now experiencing major upticks in cases, and some jurisdictions are pondering walking back. Uh, they're lifting of restrictions, and we'd like not to do that. We'd like to get ourselves opened, opened effectively and not have to walk things back, but to be able to continue to slowly um, improve our openings as the conditions in the county improve. I'm sure that, uh, you know, Dr. Gales will talk more about this, but we had a significant reduction in cases last week per day, and we can, we've continued so far with the reports this week that indicate um, lower numbers of cases, and this has given us um, some sense that we may be getting a handle on this. And uh, that is what we've been seeking to do. And, and frankly, what the governor sought to do when he, in the, when he issued his initial instructions. Um, we, were, we were a state that I think got more out in front of this um, than other states did. And we've been able to bend the curve earlier than other states were able to bend it. And I think we're seeing the benefits from it. And hopefully um, it will we'll continue in this direction. Um, I, I have to emphasize um, that even though we're reopening, it doesn't mean that the two signature things of personal protection are going to change. Um, we are going to require um, businesses to reopen, that they have to require mask, uh, face coverings when people come in the store and face coverings for their employees. This is not negotiable. It's not optional. It's a condition of what people have to do to reopen, and it's an expectation we have. The only reason we got to this point is because of physical distancing and face coverings. And there's been another major study that gives most of the credit for being able to limit the spread of COVID to face coverings. We are not going to relax that anytime soon. So normal may look like we all discover how we can make normal, interesting, and creative face masks or face coverings. Um, because looking at simple black or green or other boring singular colors may get old after a while. So hopefully this will trigger more creative use of uh, mask manufacturing. But in the meantime, we expect people to continue um, to keep their faces covered and to maintain physical distances between each other. Six feet is the general rule, and that's, that's what we expect people to do. Um, two changes from what we thought we were gonna do um, when we put out the initial guidance on opening is we are gonna allow indoor pools and outdoor pools to open for, for activities other than lap swimming, but we are gonna have limits on capacity and the time that, um, that sessions in the pool are open. We're gonna to to be very aggressive about requiring cleaning and sanitation of facilities in the pools. And uh, we're gonna ask people to socially distance because you're in a, in a pool doesn't mean you should be horsing around with each other or doing anything in the pool that we would tell you not to do when you're out of the pool. So hopefully people will follow this guidance. I think the only thing is not requiring you to wear a mask in the pool. But other than that, we want people to continue to follow this guidance. Uh, the other things that will open were, are the shopping malls. Um, we will have restrictions. The food courts will not be opening. 
and we are not going to allow people to gather in the mall as you go from one store to another. They're open for shopping. Um, people should enter the mall, go to the stores they want to shop at. This is not an opportunity to sit on the benches and hang out with people and talk. Um, this is open for shopping, not for socializing. And I know, having been a teenager in Montgomery County, the importance of Wheaton Plaza in my early youth as a socializing place. Um, but uh, we're not encouraging or going to um, allow socializing at that level uh, as we reopen. Um, I did want to talk about our, um, we've got this, we're launching a COVID core. And the COVID core, um, I think a press release has just gone out about it. That's we're looking to hire and deploy county residents who are between 16 and 23. Montgomery County uh, rec staff will coach and mentor members of the COVID core who will be deployed to work throughout the county supporting response uh, to, COVID to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, young people in the county we know need employment opportunities and the COVID core will help um, and help with that and also help in giving youth an opportunity to develop skills um, it's a unique approach to economic recovery and young people are resources that can help the county um, address, you know, some of these pressing issues. Um, there will be positions in food security, which may be, uh, will include um, working with the county, MCPS and other food serving organizations who are packaging and distributing and delivering meals around the county to vulnerable populations. There'll be opportunities for community outreach and translation. Um, Translation is really important for us, so people with language skills, you know, are especially valuable to us in this time. And also um, in Tech Connect, helping uh, teach seniors how to use technology in order to connect. We've done an increasing amount of our business on using technology, but not everybody is savvy in technology. So on the one hand, it greatly expands our reach. It means that people don't have to come into meetings. Um, there are a lot of good things that come with this, but for people who aren't tech savvy, it still remains um, a block. And we wanna help um, those folks develop the skills so they can take advantage of our ability to do increased outreach and put, on more, put out more information. So I'll stop there and uh, I guess it goes over to Dr. Gales. Good evening, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Always a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I won't add too much more to what the county executive has said uh, to leave room for questions, um, other than to say that we have seen uh, significant improvement in our metrics and our data dashboard. Uh, and particularly over the last four to five days, the number of new cases that we have seen have dropped significantly. Our average is now under 100. Uh, and we had multiple days where there, our case count was in the 50s, uh, as well as a couple of days in the 70s. So we continue to monitor that. This is potentially encouraging because it's in the setting of increased testing efforts across the county. Um, to date, we have tested over 74,000 residents. Uh, which is approximately 7.3% of our population. And we have conducted over 87,000 tests. Uh, in the last seven days, the test positivity average has dropped to 7.6%, which again is significantly lower than where we experienced in early May, around 30%. Now I will caution, however, is that even though we are seeing lower numbers of cases compared to where we were 14 days ago, we still see pockets of the virus within our community. And so our efforts moving forward is a continued, very active approach that continues to address the concerns for the county overall, but is really honing in on those areas where we continue to see increased cases. And we are looking to expand our testing access in those zip code areas, as well as access to our contact tracing mechanisms and other outreach uh, measures that we know um, are effective in terms of mitigating Gaining further transmission. So we continue that work and we continue to do what we can to drive the, the burden of the virus in our community down because that will be what is effective in determining how we move forward. To emphasize what the county executive said, 
is we still need to be vigilant, if not more so vigilant, in terms of adhering to the public health guidance around wearing face coverings, physical distancing, and avoiding crowds and spaces and interactions with others outside of our normal networks as much as possible. Because the activities that we are reopening in phase two do still carry some risk of transmission if those provisions are not adequately followed. I'll stop there, uh, turn the floor over to Dr. Stoddard, but happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Good afternoon. I only have a couple updates because I do want to obviously give us plenty of time for questions. Uh, I did want to talk a bit about our ambassador program. And so for those who aren't familiar with this, this is an effort that we undertook with the beginning of phase one. I believe the first um, um, ambassadors were out operating on June 7th, and they've been operating every day, uh, seven days a week, continuously since then. What these ambassadors are, they're actually from our Department of Housing and Community Affairs. They're, um, they're former house, they're, they're currently housing inspectors, but they're who have been sort of uh, on administrative leave until they came back to do this activity. And they're actually going out and, and working with businesses throughout the community. We've visited 1,216 businesses so far as of this morning and basically provide them guidance or recommendations or you know, uh, thoughts on how they can meet some of the public health measures and still be able to operate their businesses. If we encounter businesses that, you know, don't have as much PPE as, as they need, we'll actually provide them with the person protective equipment uh, to allow them to continue to operate. Uh, they do not, they're not, they're not issuing citations. They're not issuing um, anything in terms of closing down uh, businesses. Um, for the most part, what they've found is that um, many of the businesses are doing everything and actually in many cases going beyond the public health requirements to keep people safe. There are a few instances we found where just because of sometimes the, 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 dis, the, the discongruency between what the county's doing, what the state doing, state's doing, some businesses did not necessarily always know exactly what they were supposed to be doing in terms of uh, we had some indoor restaurants that had opened before even the state had allowed them or we had uh, other businesses that had opened prior to the county had, had allowed them and we just simply educated them about the, the current position or the current uh, openings in Montgomery County. They were very receptive to our feedback, you know, and they'll continue into phase two and uh, likely continue through the end of phase two uh, because we know many of our other businesses will be reopening and will need the same level of assistance. We continue to receive a ton of questions from uh, across the business sector on how, uh, you know, how they can effectively do reopening. And we actually have a team that is dedicated, that meets daily to go through those questions and try and give back speedy answers to the, to the inquiries. I mean, we know that we've essentially set up a, a sort of a regulatory regime as it relates to reopening in terms of rules, you know, and, and we know that there are going to be cracks in between gaps between the rules of, you know, do I qualify as a restaurant or do I qualify as a retail place, depending on the nature of my business. And uh, we're trying to answer those questions as quickly as we possibly can um, to give people the guidance that they need to operate. Um, overall, I think that that the business community has done a tremendous job in, in, in working with us. And frankly, the public has done a great job following the, their guidance. Uh, we just need to keep, you know, keep, as the county executive said, even as we reopen, we have to follow those basic public health measures that will keep us all safe. We do not want to have to go backwards. We do not want to have to close businesses. We do not want to have to, you know, implement some of the measures again that we've already had to implement, but we need the public's help and our businesses help in ensuring that that happens. Thank you all. And let's start with uh, Brianna from Bethesda Beach. She's got a question for Dr. Gales. Yes, hi. Thanks for being here today. Um, obviously, uh, the metrics have shown significant progress or have been met. Uh, where do we need to get to with the metrics in order to move to phase three? And do you expect that you will want two weeks of data from the second phase as you did with the first before deciding to move on? Sure, good afternoon, Brianna, and thank you for your question. Uh, let me be very clear, kind of in the same way we talked about at the beginning of phase two, did we need to see uh, even more significant decrease in terms of, of being able to move forward. So while yes, we are, celebrate is a, is a strong word, but while we are um, happy to see the numbers in terms of our averages being in the 50s to 60s versus the hundreds or 200s, we need that number to drop even more. 
because again, it's a balance between the types of activities that are included in those respective phases in terms of the level of interaction, the quality of interaction, and the risk of transmission associated with that. So that's why we are working to as actively and aggressively as we can identify cases very quickly, uh, dispatch services in terms of contact tracing to those points to limit the exposure of those individuals to other folks, again, to drive that number down even more. So I think those are the types of things that we'll continue to monitor. Uh, I can't say at this moment in terms of a definitive piece to say, you know, when we've achieved, certainly we would, would look at a minimum of 14 days, but I think the bigger picture is making sure those numbers are as low as possible um, and all of the other measures that approximate the impact of the virus, including the percent of hospitalizations, the utilization of emergency rooms and healthcare facilities to treat COVID-like illnesses, as well as the number of deaths, continue to decrease to a level where the burden of the virus is significantly low in the community. Thank you, Dr. Gales. Uh, next up is Randy Bass with WDVM, also for Dr. Gales on reopening. Randy. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Sorry about that. Sure, of course, little technical issues here and there. Um, Dr. Gales, in your first round of comments, you said that some of the phase two activities are, are a little bit risky. Are there any activities that are included um, in the phase two reopening that you believe to be particularly risky or any activities or scenarios um, associated with phase two where folks need to be especially vigilant um, about their practices? Sure, good afternoon, Randy, and great question. Uh, so I want folks at home to understand that we looked at all of the different activities that we have put forward and assess their risk of transmission uh, and included language and provisions to strengthen uh, the safety and mitigate any, any types of transmission. So when you look across the spectrum, so it's, it's not just one, one particular activity, for example, it's all of the different things. So the county executive mentioned malls. So malls in itself, businesses have provisions that have uh, parameters to limit the capacity in those spaces. But we know that interior sections of malls can be places where people can easily congregate. And we don't want that to happen. So that's why we said malls can open, but we put in provisions to say we're limiting the number of folks who can uh, be in those spaces and minimizing the areas that could promote uh, congregate sections that would enhance transmission. So similarly, when we look across the board, you know, even in swimming pools, so saying that swimming pools can be open, not just for laps, lap uh, swimming, uh, we put in parameters to limit the capacity of folks there and ensure that when you're not in the pool, yes, you are wearing a face covering and there's adequate spacing between you and other uh, users of, of the, the facility. Similarly, when we look at gym activities, you know, we've said that gyms can open, their limits to the capacity, as well as, you know, requiring face coverings to minimize the ability to transmit from person to person. So I say all that to say that we have been very uh, thoughtful and careful in looking at the types of activities uh, and provisions to allow for folks to be able to enjoy and participate in, but also very clear about maximizing the need and the level of precautions that have been put into place to be able to enjoy those particular activities. Okay, thank you, Randy and Dr. Gales. Kate Ryan with WTOP has a question for the County Executive and also Dr. Gales about pool operations and masks. That's right. Uh, there were a lot of questions yesterday on requirement for mask or advisory to wear a mask is is it a law is there can people be citing for not wearing the mask that's number one and number two during yesterday's meeting before the council there were a lot of questions about pool operations and council member albornoz who as you know was head of parks and rec said he remained quite concerned about pool operations it sounded like he was concerned about safety with lifeguards who have to take care of everything else and now might, do they have to sanitize? Do they have to police people for mask wearing? And are you fully staffed for those pools? And lastly, on the pool question, are people going to be told, okay, we're at capacity, 
you've been here two hours, let somebody else in? Are you gonna limit the time spent at a pool? So I, there were a series of questions, so I will try to, to answer as best as I can from, from memory. Uh, and Dr. Stoddard and County Executive Elridge, feel free to jump in as well. Um, I think that ex the expectation is that face coverings will be worn and required to be worn in spaces, again, where physical distancing is difficult. We already have that requirement very clearly in place in terms of our indoor facilities, and the expectation is that they will be worn in outdoor spaces as well you know, for example, where physical distancing is not, not possible uh, because we know the value of it in particular protecting the trans rate of transmission, particularly from those who are asymptomatic. Um, and as, as spelled out very clearly, I think in many aspects of the, the executive order, there are special commentary points where we say, where you know, we specifically call out where masks are needed to be worn in those particular settings. So for example, obviously you can't wear a mask when you're swimming, but while you are outside of the pool, and for example, the staff who are associated with the pool facility should have on mask as well as the clients. Um, and I think the expectation is, I think one of the other things is, is even when we're saying businesses can open, it also gives businesses the time to be able to have the necessary provisions in place, whether it's staffing or those types of things. It's not saying just because it's open on Friday that you have to open that day. And so right. the expectation is that, uh, you know, businesses will have time to do what they need to do to have the necessary provisions in place to make sure that the facilities can be used safely in a general sense, but also have the extra safety precautions put in place to mitigate transmission of the virus. And again, on, on pool, will there be a time limit? I can see yesterday there was the comment, I think you heard it when they said, you can't just park there all day. You know, you just can't. That's a lot of people do that in the summertime. That's how they spend their days. But to be fair and equitable, you know, because capacity will be an issue, will people be asked to leave after a certain amount of time? So I'll, I'll, I can address that. So obviously, when it comes to, I mean, the county operates pools through our Department of Recreations, and for those pools, there will be a set of set of, you know, there will be a process that looks very much like you've described that we will be talking about more. Uh, where where you have a block of time that you're going to sort of reserve and you'll 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 be in for a period of time then you'll leave the more details to come on that uh, to, and also I think that we've we've alluded to this I certainly alluded to this in the council session yesterday but the count the the Department of Recreation operated pools will not open on on Friday um, they will follow along shortly hopefully shortly thereafter and we'll have a schedule for that but obviously um, we, you know, we, we, like we've said this whole time, have been following the data and therefore did not, we couldn't tell our pools that, hey, get ready to open on, you know, uh, the 19th because that's the exact day that we're going to be ready to move forward. And so obviously they've got to hire 600 seasonal workers and train them. And as you've alluded to, you know, train them in a way that is a little bit different than they have in the past. And so it's going to take a little bit of time for that to happen. And so the county operated pools will not open on Friday. Uh, they will likely follow thereafter and they will come with some, with a, with a, essentially a, a very close to a reservation process where you're right, we do want to be equitable with the distribution of our county pool resource to make sure that we have, you know, everyone can get an opportunity who wants to, to utilize them and they'll do, they'll do blocks of time. So I'll just add that, um, yeah, um, Dr. Stoddard, you know, talked about our ambassador program and that, you know, we're not giving out tickets or anything. Uh, the governor's order has a $5,000 fine and up to one year in prison misdemeanor for not following the mask order. So we're not starting there, but I guarantee you that if we encounter businesses that do not have their employees masked, aren't following sanitation, if they're allowing customers to come in the store, without masks, they won't stay open. It's that simple. We, you know, our job opening or not opening is keeping people safe. And we've had enough experience and this country's had enough experience on what keeps people safe and what puts people at risk. And we are gonna delineate the physical spacing and the wearing of a face covering. And that is something we expect everybody to do 
anytime they're in a public place with other people with obvious exceptions like swimming and when you're in indoor dining we don't expect you to wear a mask and eat that would be rather difficult but if you're not sitting at your table and eating you will be wearing a mask and that's it's that simple and we expect you know the businesses that have wanted to open to understand that this will not only make their their folks safer It'll probably make their customers feel better because if customers go in and see that we're doing the things that we know were helpful in, in turning the curve on this thing, um, that'll probably give customers a higher level of confidence to go into these businesses. We already know that from polls that have been done, that people may be less ready to enter businesses than businesses are ready to open. And a lot of that has to do with concerns about spread. We want to make sure that People don't have the concerns. More importantly, we want to make sure it doesn't spread. Thank you, Kate, for your questions. Amy Cho with Channel 4 has a question for the County Executive on July 4th. Hi, my question, uh, yeah, like you said, looking ahead to July 4th, um, obviously a day when, you know, a lot of people may be wanting to gather, things like that. And of course, fireworks are illegal in Montgomery County, but do you all have any concerns about people not following the social distancing guidelines? And are you going to be putting any policies into place to ensure that social distancing on that day? I don't know how you put a policy in place that's different than your policy for every other day of this period. Um, I can't imagine how I'd legislate for July 4th uh, any differently than what we've said we, we expect from people on all the other days of this month. So we're hoping that people take this seriously. And since you're in a county where you can't buy fireworks, even sparklers, um, that you know there should, there should not be many um, of the kinds of gatherings where people are celebrating. I mean, a lot of people go to the big events that have traditionally been held uh, we're not holding ours this year. Um, and I think that uh, that should help tamp down some of the groupings. But I'm hoping if people are having a picnic, that they just stick by the rules. I mean, we, I don't have enough police to drive by every street and look at every party and make sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. So far, I think people have been pretty responsible and pretty responsive to what we've asked them to do. And we're hoping they can resist the temptation to break out of that on July 4th. That would just be a mistake. And I think most people get that. Okay, thank you, Amy. Um, Brianna is back with a question for Dr. Gales and the county exec on testing. Yes, um, I'm not sure who wants to answer this one, um, but I have a question regarding an update on the advogenics testing. I believe it was last week um, that you all said there was a delay in launching those uh, since the system was still being set up to be able to share data with the state. Um, so what is kind of the updated timeline of that? Um, and I know on June 8th, it was initially supposed to provide up to 20,000 per week. So what's the updated timeline for that capacity? Sure, I'd be happy to start. So I wanna frame it in the larger context of the uh, larger efforts that we're doing to increase testing across uh, the jurisdiction uh, and one that we talked about before uh, we'll be releasing uh, more as a, as a press release uh, but we will be standing up our mobile testing uh, option next week uh, which will allow for us to be able to do pop-up testing um, continue to support the current locations that we have as well as identify other areas where we may be able to create new spaces to do testing as well as uh, continue some of the efforts that we uh, utilize the ready responder team from the state to test at homes or within uh, concentrated neighborhood locations. Uh, and so that will be helpful. And I know that was a something else brought up in, in the chat uh, in terms of asking about testing access in particular neighborhoods such as downtown Silver Spring. This is an important option because it allows us to be able to, again, identify uh, testing gaps and areas to perform testing, particularly in high volume zip codes that are potentially more accessible by foot, uh, maybe less restrictive in terms of requiring a provider's referral or uh, 
being, you know, to, to be able to do walk-up testing versus schedule testing. So we will be standing up some of those opportunities as beginning uh, next week. Um, and that feeds into the contract that we have with Avigenix. Uh, as you know, that option is a high throughput option that uh, is built upon self-collection, uh, which would create the opportunity to support some of those pop-up areas because it would require less infrastructure and less use of personal protective equipment and those kind of things. We have done some um, soft pilots, if you will, uh, with diff some different groups uh, to test out the system. Uh, the patient registration system is up and running and we are testing that. And we are hoping to green light very shortly. We have distributed a number of kits to different uh, groups within uh, county, um, again, working with our prioritization, as we've talked about before, our first line of responders, essential employees, as well as our nursing homes and assisted living facilities. So I say all that to say that it is, we have released some of those kits already, and we have started to test in a limited capacity. And as soon as uh, the final details, which hopefully today, we'll be able to launch some of those larger scale testing efforts with those priority groups that we mentioned. That cover it, Brianna? Uh, yes, thanks. Okay. Um, and then Lillian Moss has a question with County Cable yeah. Montgomery uh, for the County Executive regarding evictions. Lillian? Unmute yourself, Lillian. I, I did. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to know um, uh, where is the county standing in terms of evictions? We haven't heard much from the governors, but, um, in, but since the county is reopening in a slower pace, um, at a slower pace, I wanted to know where we're standing in terms of evictions. That's one of the questions that we get the most. So the pause on evictions is based on an order from the governor and it lasts as long as his emergency order lasts and we don't know how long he's going to keep his emergency order in place um, everything he's doing in terms of um, even easing the restrictions is based on the authority he has under the emergency order um, i'm hoping it stays in place and i'm hoping it stays in place long enough for people to persuade him that he needs to extend the period for eviction relief beyond the end of the emergency order. The county does not have the ability to do this. I have asked our attorney whether I could issue a comparable order. I cannot issue a comparable order. Um, the governor can do this. The president of the United States could do this. Um, I cannot. Um, if I could, I would. I would have done it in the very beginning. Uh, so we're hoping that um, I'd like to see the emergency order stay in place for a long time, um, if for no other reason than to make sure that people don't get summarily evicted um, as soon as the order is lifted. I'm hoping that um, landlords work out um, with their tenants um, means of recovering some of their losses, but making it possible for tenants to stay in their buildings. I know commercially I was very happily surprised when I was in Wheaton the other day that a, um, a small business owner uh, pointed out that their commercial landlord tenant had basically um, foregone several months of rent, which I thought was just really, really good, really, I think, decent, and not something I've heard about because uh, we're still getting letters from people about certain landlords uh, threatening evictions and legal fees and everything else on commercial tenants who have not been able to pay their rent. So I, um, I wish people would all agree that we have to take, everybody's taking a haircut in this thing and that uh, everybody does what they can to make sure that people aren't displaced. It would be, you know, people have used the word tsunami. If people are suddenly faced with evictions and on the scale that are out there, and given particularly the lack of, of housing that's affordable for people in the lower income ranges, which we do not produce housing for under our MPDU program, um, those people are going to be just extraordinarily hard hit by this. And everybody seems to acknowledge it. 
Now the question is whether we can get the governor, the state legislature, or Congress to do something about it. All right, thank you, Mr. County Executive. And for those who missed the top of our uh, media briefing, we did release uh, something on uh, the COVID core that um, the County Executive referenced off the top of this briefing regarding summer employment for county residents ages 16 to 23. They will be helping out with uh, various components of our recovery, uh, passing out PPE, working on food security. So please take a look at that. Let us know if you'd like to cover that. If you need any questions, just or have any questions, send them our way. We appreciate you joining us as always, and we will see you back here next Wednesday, if not sooner, for any major breaking news. Take care. Be safe. Bye. Thank you.